to another episode of Turn Left. I am your host, Indiana's own Data Black, coming to you live. Yes, all the way live from Black Girl Studios, where we talk about Indiana politics from the left side of things. Okay, I know it's been a while. I had I was away for the whole month. I know, I know. There was a lot that happened. Oh my God. Oh my God, there was so much that has happened since we last spoke and saw each other. Uh, can I say, first of all, uh, shout out to uh, Act Blue and all of the work that they are doing to make sure that black women for Harris, black men for Harris, white dudes for Harris, uh, labor for Harris, this, people with disabilities for Harris, they were able to process over a half a billion dollars to that campaign. And the campaign has been so successful at fundraising. Guess what they're doing? They're giving money down ballot. So, uh, you notice I didn't say um, white women for Harris because they, did, they didn't use Act Blue. I, I don't know why they didn't. But, hey, everybody is on board. Listen, before we left, I was like, I'm riding with Biden. And I was feeling some kind of way that people was trying to push him out. And then when he said, okay, I'm done, but I'm endorsing my VP, I was like, what? This is happening and and picking her vice presidential running mate the governor of minnesota governor walls all of this has been amazing it's been a lot it's been a whirlwind it's been whoo it's been a whirlwind first we had biden now we have harris and the energy is high y'all the energy is high so the first time i knew that the energy was off the hook for this new campaign was when I went down to Louisville for Act Blue for the NCSL. That's the uh, the conference for state legislators, and I was man in the booth, right? And you could tell <laughs> who the Republican because this is not bipartisan, nonpartisan, right? Because it's all state legislators, and you could tell who the Republicans were, and you could tell who the Democrats were. Republicans were walking around with the head down, but Democrats. They were walking around with their heads held high, baby. They were excited about it all. Then I had the opportunity for the first time in my life, first time ever, to go to the DNC. Oh, my God. What an amazing experience. I have watch the the dnc I've, I've also watched the rnc um but uh don't compare i tell you what seeing a homogenous group of people get together is totally different than seeing a kaleidoscope of humans get together and celebrate their nominees i'm telling you the energy and the joy that resonated from inside the United Center and over at McCormick's place and how people were excited about this. This is translating, y'all. This is this is all age groups, all demographics. People are on board with this campaign, and I cannot be more excited. But let me tell you about my experience. I only got to be at the United Center on Monday night and Thursday night. Yes, the nights that I got to hear President Biden speak and the love that everyone showed him and we love you, Joe, the chance of we love you, Joe, because people don't realize how important it was what he did. He sacrificed leadership. How many most people don't give up willingly give up power unless they get voted out. And even in some of them, if they orange, once they get voted out, they still don't want to give up power. Right. But he willingly gave up power because he saw the nation needed something else. Our democracy needed something else. And so there was so much love and gratitude uh, in, in showing him how much we appreciated uh, his leadership and how he managed to say, you know what, I'm good, I'm gonna let this go. But then the best part of Monday night, nobody knew that the vice president was coming. And when she walked out on that stage, oh my God, the United Center exploded like a game six of the 1990 Chicago Bulls winning a championship. It was like that. It was, oh my God, nobody knew she was there. She walks out, the place erupts. 
Now there were some great speeches. I, I only some of the speeches I had to watch on TV. Uh, I, I thought that uh, AOC. Uh, I got to hear her. Man, she brought it. Like I'm like, oh, this the next generation. You know, Hakeem Jeffries. He brought it. He has that cadence that he does and that alliteration that he does. He did his thing. But to me, uh, and, and oh wait, Elizabeth Warren and her feelings and feeling appreciated. Like, like she didn't know that we were appreciating all the consumer protections that she had been working on. And we knew, we knew in the love that she got. But honestly, for me, for me, the best speech of the week, including the vice president's speeches, the best speech of the week was former first lady Michelle Obama. Listen, Hillary did great. I, that Hillary should have been speaking in 2016. I don't know where that Hillary came from. She was great. But hands down, hands down, Michelle Obama was the absolute best. I mean, she called him out. She put she wasn't going high no more. She was done. And and you know what? When she said that maybe Trump didn't know that he was, you know, applying for one of those black jobs. And that brought the house down. But the remix, y'all, have y'all heard the remix? Who's going to tell him that the job he's currently seeking might just be one of those black jobs? Those black jobs. One of those black jobs. Those black jobs. One of those black jobs. Those black jobs. One of those black jobs. Who's going to tell him that the job might be one of those black jobs? I'm here to do my black, black, black job. This is the job. I'm here to do my black, black, black job. This is what we joyful about. Black job. One of those black jobs. Who's going to tell him that the job might be one of those black jobs? Okay, I'm the attorney general. Might be one of those black jobs. Man, that remix is so dope. But look. That was the joy, right? And the message of the entire convention is we won't go back. We won't go back. We will not go back to the time where women uh, couldn't get their own credit cards or buy their own, get their own mortgages or rent their own apartments without somebody else signing for it. We will not go back. Okay. Uh, I did find it hilarious that everybody thought Beyonce was going to be there. Now, listen, I'm, I'm not a beehiver. Uh, not my thing, but hey, I love it if y'all love it. Um, but the star of the DNC is what, sh what it should have been, and that was politics and the nomination of the first woman of color as president of the United States of America. She will win. She's going to win because we're going to get out and do everything that we have to do to make sure she wins. We're going to make sure that we put in work. We're not going to leave it for chance. We're going to just blow it out the water. I mean, we, we can, in Indiana, we can have, oh my God, we can have a 2008. All we got to do is turn out. All we got to do is turn out. And you know what else I've been seeing? What else I've been seeing is like that excitement for VP Harris is trickling down, right? I'm seeing some excitement for McCormick. I'm seeing excitement for Wells. I'm telling y'all there's an opportunity for us to really make history, think about it. Everybody at the top of our ticket, the lead, are women. Think about that. Women, 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 women. It's our time, and we won't go back. So uh, it was an amazing week. Um, I'm sorry I, didn't, I couldn't get more candidates on. Uh, you know, it was just fantastic being at the DNC. Uh, probably the best night was I got to go to the House of Blues and listen to Boys to Men uh, as a part of my job. I mean, we were a sponsor of the event, so it was a part of my job. I mean, tough work for me, right? <laughs> but no, uh, guys, I hope you guys are still feeling that momentum after the convention. I am. I hope you guys take that out into the streets and recruit people and get people registered to vote and all the things that we need to make sure uh, that we elect uh, Vice President Kamala Harris. Okay, I want to just give y'all some dates I want you to pencil in because these are important dates for you to put on your calendar. Okay, the presidential debate, September 10th. That's when the orange menace, the orange felon, the con goes against the prosecutor. I believe this will be entertaining. I believe it will be heady um, because uh, the vice president is smart and Donald Trump is not. And most people are not going to understand what she's talking about anyway on his side. And they're going to tell you that all the lies that he spews were great. 
We're not going to do that, right? We we know what the deal really is, okay? So mark that on your calendar, presidential debate, September 10th, and then on September 11th, I will be at Wish TV giving my post-debate analysis. Um, if you guys want, I may even do like a live stream of the debate. I don't know. It might be something to do uh, just to make sure that we're all engaged and in community. Maybe we'll do that. Um, okay, a couple of more dates I want you guys to write down because this is about the state house, the state house, which is important. There's two governor debates, two governor debates. Fox News is hosting one on October 2nd, and Wish TV is hosting one on October 3rd. And again, I'll be in studio to do um, post-debate analysis for Wish TV on uh, October 3rd. So, guys, I know there's excitement about Vice President Harris, um, but we also have to make sure that we uh, do everything we can to get Jennifer McCormick and uh, uh, Terry Gooden in our state house because Micah Beckwith is dangerous. He's dangerous. He's more hazardous than smoking cigarettes. I just want you to understand. He's hazardous. Um, all, all his white supremacy nonsense, Christian nationalist nonsense. You know, dude can't seem to understand how the Constitution works because he thinks that we are a Christian nation. We're not. There is a separation of state and church. He doesn't want to believe that. He wants to indoctrinate you, whether you're Jewish, Muslim, Hindu, or uh, atheist. He wants to indoctrinate you and your children. But they say we do it. So, guys, this is real serious. And if we don't get Ty Rakita's dumbass out of the, that seat, oh, my God, he's the worst AG ever. I've never seen someone so spineless in all my life. Like, I mean, he he's so spineless. He's a shrill. All he does is kiss booty. Kiss booty. That's all he does. His lips ought to be real chap or he has a subscription and a sponsorship to chapstick because that's all he does is kiss booty. So guys, state house is so important. Uh, remember that get on board, watch the debates, tell your people about it and let's win some stuff. Let's piss some people off and let's win some elections. All right. Now I got to run some ads y'all. My sponsors, Bones, unique boutique. Today's show is brought to you by Bohm's Unique Boutique. Click on the QR code. And for all Turn Left listeners, you can get a 10% discount on your order by using the code DEMOCRAT. Be sure to visit www.bohmsuniqueboutique.com. Democrats, are you looking for an affordable digital content creation solution? Then look no further than Black Pearl IT Solutions and Black Pearl Studios. Indiana's own Dana Black is providing many of the communication wraparound services any Democratic organization needs. No matter the size of the budget, Indiana's own and Black Pearl Studios have you covered. Just scan the QR code or visit www.blackpearl-its.com. All right, all right, y'all. Woo, I'm still on a high. All right, I got great guests. Now, I, it, you know what? When I scheduled tonight, we had no idea that the vice president would be our nominee for president of the United States. When I scheduled this show, I had no idea that I was going to have two women on as the first guest after we nominated a woman of color as president of the United States. It just worked out that way. Y'all, first up, we have, let me just say, if we really want the vice president to be successful in her with her agenda, we have got to send people to Congress that can help buoy that. So we've got to send these two women to Congress. Okay, first up, running in District 2, Miss Lori Camp. Lori, welcome to the show. Thank you. And my friend and, and someone who does not give up, and I love her for that, running in District 6, my friend, Cindy Worth. Cindy, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Dana, and thank you for your show. It's, it's priceless. Guys, as you can tell, I am still on a high from the DNC. Tell me how you got, I know y'all watched most of it. Cindy, you were in Chicago. I know you were there with me. You stood in line with me. Tell me your reaction, Lori, 
uh, 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 of the week and what you watched and what was, what did, what was the most exciting part for you? Um, well, it was all fairly exciting. Um, I actually was taking my daughter back to college. Um, otherwise we would have probably tried to go, but she goes to college in Pennsylvania. So, um, Monday night we watched it before we got ready to go. And then Tuesday night, we watched it in a hotel room, Wednesday night in a hotel room. And then in Thursday, believe it or not, I drove back from Pennsylvania, 10 and a half hours to attend a watch party up here in the second district wow. in Elkhart um, with a bunch of members of uh, the black community. And uh, it was, it was amazing. Honestly, um, I will say I'm a little, uh, you were talking about how Michelle Obama was your favorite speech. Um, I loved her speech too, but she said something that I had been trying to say so much better than I ever say it. So I'm a little miffed about that. When she <laughs> talked about the generational wealth and falling forward, I have been trying to say to my constituents, you know, we have somehow gotten to this point where if you are born to generational wealth, we look at you like you're better than people that aren't born to generational mm -hmm. wealth. And your birth is luck, right? right? Um, so when she said that, I was like, oh my gosh, how can she do this to me? Um, yeah. And my husband's like, well, it is Michelle Obama. And my daughter's like, it is Michelle Obama, mom. <laughs> but so, yeah, I I mean. Well, now you can just quote her. Yeah, that, and, and that's kind of what I do. I'm like, she said it so much better than me. But um, I love the excitement. And I love what you said about when you were down at the conference, because as we are campaigning around here, when we are with, you know, members of the other party, what you described is so true. They are like surly, they're like mad and upset, and we're all like joyous and happy and let's go. So um, I am noticing a real uh, kind of shift in attitudes. Um, I think they know that we've got a wave that we're going to ride, hopefully to the white house, to Congress, the Senate, the governorship. Um, we got a bunch of great local candidates. Um, but yeah, the, the DNC, I was like so fired up and so excited. I, I watched every minute of it. I love it. Cindy, what about you? Well, we we met there in the parking lot in the <laughs> yes, United did. Center. <laughs> I was like, hey, there's Dana. Um, you have to, I should have dug that picture out. But um, I, I mean, as you remember, even the bus ride there, and then you get into that big mass of people trying to, you know, wait in line and get into the United Center. And it was it was all joy. No one in that hot, hot sun was out right. there complaining. We're all just, I mean, it. somebody said we were joyful warriors, and I think that really stuck. Um, it was all selfies and, you know, hey, how's it going? And, I mean, just I have so many new friends, and <sighs> um, I, I'm sure you do too. I mean, I met a lady who came as a volunteer from Honolulu. Oh. And, yeah, and and I mean, so like I emailed her the other day, and and she had gotten a pass to go in Tuesday, and I was I was just I was leaving, and so I was like, hey, how did it go? And she sends me all of these beautiful pictures, um, because she really wanted to hear Michelle Obama speak, so she got to go, and then she got to go the next night too. Wow. So she, I mean, just and and that was what was so amazing about it is I went to do the caucus work, um, you know, to, mm -hmm. to go to the caucuses, which is what I did when I was in DC. I, I went to a lot of the caucus meetings and um, looked at, you know, worked on policy there. So that's, you know, why I received that invitation to go. And, and I know what that's about. So I thought, well, it's easier if I show up to do this work and it's not that far. So I stayed out of the city and drove in. And then one of my old colleagues um, noticed I wasn't wearing credentials and says, hey, you should go tonight. Here's a pass. Um, so yeah, I, I got to be Cinderella for one night and it was the most joyful night. And mm -hmm. like you said, um, really that we love Joe um, and thanking him for for what, what he did. Um, that was just incredible. But like you said, when she brought down the house, I don't know, I think it might've been bigger than the 96 Bulls because <laughs> I think we might've um, cracked the ceiling tiles in there. Well, we, well, we definitely cracked something. I'll tell you on, on Thursday was, uh, capacity standing room only i stood for the whole thursday night because i had to man the booth and they were saying people were getting there at like 11 o'clock 
and I I had to man the booth until like uh, three thirty or four three thirty four o'clock. So I couldn't go any earlier. And by the time I get there, there are no seats. People have saved seats, and I am literally in the rafters. And I stood. I found a buddy who we both were like. Okay, why don't we sit back to back and we can kind of lean on each other on the floor for a couple hours because I had monitors up. I, I didn't stay in the whole time, but we, you know, like you said, you met some amazing people. Um, all the events that we went to um, from an Act Blue perspective met a bunch of young people who were excited. And gosh, it was an experience of a lifetime. But I got to ask, ladies. I mean, we are women in this business. And even though the vice president hasn't really talked about the significance of gender and race in this in this election cycle, um, it is incredibly significant. Uh, Lori, tell me we, we've gone through this once where we nominated a woman, but here we are again. Tell me what this means again to say, hey. We're going to try this again, and we even have a woman of color this time. I, I know of, of the three of us, I'm the woman of color, but I'm going to chime in after y'all. But talk to me and tell me how you feel about this, because y'all good allies. Tell me, uh, tell yeah. me how you feel. Uh, so I am really excited. Um, I don't know if voters know, but I work in software, right, which is a male-dominated field. Yes. And so I see firsthand all of the time where women have to work, I mean, harder, smarter. Um, and, you know, you would think I've been at the same, uh, working in software since 1998, 26 years. Um, the, the day I filed was my 26th anniversary. So I know how hard it is for a woman to succeed in a man's world. Mm. And so I am so excited because the whole, I know it's cliche, but the whole, you can't be it unless you can see it is yeah. so true. Yeah. Um, it is hard to imagine yourself in something that you've never seen. Yeah. So for all of the the little girls out there or the big girls out there, um, it just kind of, again, Hillary cracked the ceiling and VP Harris, I'm hoping just blast right through. And I know nobody wants, you know, nope, she doesn't want to talk about it, which I totally understand because when you're in the position, the minute you say anything, they're like, oh, it's an excuse. It's this, it's that. But um, seriously, this is huge. And if we can get her over the finish line, it is going to mean so much to so many women, whether they're two-year-olds right now yeah. or like me, 57 or even older. I love it. I love it. Cindy? Um, I, I am a scientist, so I'm, I'm right there with you in the yeah. male-dominated world. Um, you know, I've been sidelined and told to babysit kids on a field project before. What? So, um, yeah, you know, you just you keep going. Um, but I, I do I do kind of respect the fact that, yeah, she, she said she she doesn't want to make a thing of it. And then I kind of see why. But it is so impactful. Um, when I was on the Hill, my former boss, who's now she passed away in um, last year, but she said something to me that changed my entire life. And that was, could you imagine um, what our world would be like if we had not ignored over half of the collective brain power for generations? Mm. And that, and then it's actually the basis of my doctoral thesis that um, will be finished sometime in the next year. Um, because on, that, that changed my life, um, that comment that I'd never had that perspective of it, even as a scientist before. And so I think when you're, when you're talking about representation and not being able to be what you can't see, um, that's so true. Um, you know, in science, the only scientist I knew in my entire town was one doctor and she left after three years. Um, now there were more, but, but we didn't see them. Right. Um, right. And I think that is, is a, is critically important. And we have so many women, like, like you said, the top of our tickets, all women. Yeah. Um, that's exciting. And in a lot of places that starts with, with Lori and I all the way up. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, uh, if I'm not mistaken, there are three, there's a woman running for Senate. United States Senate and three women running for Congress. So that yes. is like, so not only do we have a woman running for governor and a woman running for attorney general and the, I mean, it's just, it's loaded. And I'll, I'll tell you what, as a woman of color, you know, uh, first of all, uh, anybody else tell, come to me about some uh, OBS about is she black or is she uh, Southeast Asian? I'm gonna whoop you behind because she both. 
I mean, we do know that there are mixed race people. They even have it on the census these days. Mixed race people. But to see, you know, she she identifies with her Southeast Asian mother who raised her as a single parent who also was in the sciences, right? Um, mm-hmm. uh, but she but she chose to go to Howard University and HBCU. She chose to pledge uh, a black sorority. So she she gets the culture. She gets the culture. And, you know, we in the community, in the black political spaces, we often say black women save our democracy. We often save our democracy. We did it in Alabama. We did it in Georgia. Black women stepping up, doing the dirty work, doing the unsung work. I, too, am in IT, or was before I started working at Act Blue. And I, too, have been, not only was I not the only woman in there, I was the only woman of color. And, or I may not have been the only woman, but I was the only woman of color, or I was the only black woman. Especially in somebody, no, somebody should have told me that, you know, yes, you can do IT in Indiana, but, you know, not really. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because people yeah. hire who they're comfortable with, right? And so people wasn't hiring me. I am so excited for what this is and what it looks like. And symbols mean something, right? If, if symbols didn't mean anything, we wouldn't have a cross to represent Christianity. If symbols didn't mean something, they wouldn't have the Star of David or all the other symbols that are represented with all the different religious and all the different spaces, we wouldn't have, or, you know, military symbols with the, with the bars and the, you know, crescents and all the things, symbols matter. And like you said, um, there's a little girl right now who is wearing pigtails and her hair is curly and she's got more melanin than, than a lot of other people around her. And she knows, and she believes that she can truly be anything she wants to be, including the president of the United States. So, whew, I, I'm still on. A, I'm okay. I'm coming down. I'm coming down. Y'all, let's get it's into huge. It, it's it's it, it's everything. Like I remember last thing. I remember when uh, President Barack Obama won, and that was in uh, 2008. I can't remember how old my father was, but he was uh, in his 70s at that point. And I called him election night, and he was in tears. Now, this is a man who was a manly man, testosterone through the roof, right? Because, you know, little dudes are usually like that. He was only five, six, so he had extra testosterone, right? He was crying because he couldn't believe what he was witnessing. And that's this, that's going to happen again in 2024. There are going to be elders in our community who are going to weep that we actually did it. And we're saving democracy at the same time. All right, let's get into talking about y'all. That DNC had me going. I hope you guys are hyped. Lori, tell the people who you are and where you come from. Okay, well, I am from South Bend, Indiana. I have lived here all 57 years of my life. Um, I am a product of public schools, grade school, middle school, high school. Um, As I said, I've worked in IT. My degree is actually in criminal justice. Um, I kind of figured that I would never make enough money to pay off my student loans if I didn't switch careers, so I did. Um, Went briefly into banking. So the prosecutor and the felon, um, that, I mean, the whole law and order that really, because if you've done any research in criminal justice, you know, it is not geared toward punishing white men, mm. especially rich white men. So for him to have been found guilty by a jury of his peers, that's a, as they say, a big effing deal. Um, so left, uh, criminal justice went to work in banking. Um, Actually in banking, I was up for a private business spot and I was told we need a foursome for our golf outings Mm -hmm. and you're a woman. And so there are places you won't be able to golf. Oh, then why would they go? Um, it bad, honestly, when this is back in the early, late eighties, early nineties, and there were still some golf clubs that would not allow women during the business hours. Wow. Um, crazy in Indiana. Um, so I started looking for a new job and a person that I had worked with at the bank, a customer said, Hey, I know this guy that's hiring. You want to talk to him? Um, went in and talked to him, got hired. 
Um, I started on the marketing side of the company and basically an employee that they had hired on the technical side, like ghosted us, like didn't show up after a week. And my current boss, who was kind of a friend said, do you want to try this? And I was like, sure, why not? So I worked my butt off, worked from, you know, back then things were slow, eight to eight at night, um, learning stuff, doing stuff and moved up to my current position where I do all of the training for our customers all over the country. I was just nice. in Colorado a few weeks ago. Um, I do our QA testing. Again, we're a very small company. Um, I manage our service department and I do contract compliance, which means that I'm making sure that our company follows all of the federal regulations that are needed. And uh, so that's how I got. I've done a ton of volunteer work, coached high school diving, um, have been on board, says treasurer. Um, worked with our school board here in South Bend on a magnet committee to better our magnet schools and things like that. So um, I'm kind of a jack of all trades. If my husband keeps saying I need to learn how to say no, um, <laughs> because uh, how I how I got here is kind of because I said why not instead of no. So um, so that's my story. Uh, that's, that's so is that how you got it to run run for office? Somebody asked you to run and you didn't because you know it takes seven asks for most women. Okay, so I saw a post on Facebook, and it said my opponent was running unopposed. And I commented, are you kidding me? We don't have an opponent for a Congress person in the 2nd District. I can do it. I'm a Democrat. I live in the 2nd District. Thinking, again, I just commented on Facebook posts, thought I would never, ever hear anything. Put my phone down, hopped in the shower, got back out of the shower, and someone said, are you serious? Again, I said, sure, why not? Um, put the phone down. By the time I got to work, I had a phone call. By 2 o'clock, I had filled out the paperwork. By 6 o'clock, I had talked to the head of the 2nd District, and he took my paperwork down by 11.20 on Friday. I freaking love that story. Because, <laughs> look, you know, I, I if I could, I'd be a career politician, right? I, I'm, I'm not. But you are a citizen in a, saying, I am going to be a participant in the citizen government. I love that story. I love that story. Have you had you always been politically active, though? No, no. I, I mean, voting. Yes, I've always I mean, since part of the whole thing was um, my mom always took me voting when she went to vote, you know, back with the curtains and the little levers. Um, yes. My daughter, I would drag her in her baby carrier to go vote. And, you know, when she was bigger, hold her hand and, you know, she'd be like, can I color the box for you, mom? Sure. Um, so when I saw that there was no one running, my heart literally broke because I was like, who's my kid going to vote for? Right. Um, you know, we're not Republicans here. So um, and I was just like, and what about all the other people? I mean, no choice. Yeah. I mean, seriously, it just was like nails on a blackboard. Um and in that vein, it's kind of funny because my daughter is actually in college taking uh, elections, campaigns and elections this semester. And she was actually in class the other day and her um, professor put up a slide that says, a democracy with everything but a choice. A new analysis of American elections finds that in half of all race for partisan offices, a candidate runs unopposed. What? Democrats are the biggest no-shows. Wow. And she, put, you, she said, you better bet I brought up that my mama was stopping that. <laughs> wow. So, so, yeah, that's me. All right, Democrats, we got to be better. We can't be no-shows because we won't go back. Cindy, nope. this is t time number two, but remind the people, remind them who you are and where you come from. So I'm Cindy Worth. I'm originally from Bartholomew County, Columbus, Indiana, where I still live. Um, I'm a seventh generation here on my mother's side, so I didn't get very far. Um, I live about a half a block from where my great, great grandmother lived. Wow. Um, yeah, like I said, I didn't get very far. Um, my house was moved, though, so I always wonder if maybe she was in my house at some point and like had tea or something. But um, that was, you know. Back in the late 1800s, early 1900s. So I'm so I'm from here, um, as local as it gets. Uh, my husband and I came back from college and opened a furniture store on Washington Street here in our small town. Um, and I was um, part of our Main Street program and our downtown merchants program um, and was in leadership with that, you know, when I was a very young woman um, and was asked to run for office. Um, 
a couple times and of course you know said of course not i can't do that <laughs> um and then fast forward you know my husband and i lost everything in the flood in 2008 um wow. and, and that includes health insurance because that's you know of course tied to your job right. um so i went to work teaching science in high school um because they needed science teachers and i needed health insurance um you know i had kids in school so I taught for 10 years, broke all the rules, won some national awards, um, and ended up a fellow on Capitol Hill. Wow. And when I got the call, um, they said, hey, you've been selected as a fellow to go to Capitol Hill. And I said, could I go to National Science Foundation or NASA? <laughs> and they said, honey, it's Capitol Hill or nothing. So <laughs> yes or no, right now. And I was like, fine, I'll go. Um, and I just absolutely over time fell in love with it. Um, I was in two different offices on the Hill. The first one was Jared Polis's. Um, and I ended up writing a little bill in his office that um, I researched it and wrote it. It was original and it made its way all the way through the House and the Senate. Um, after that Congress ended and a new Congress came in, um, I rewrote it for um, Joe Nagus, um, who came oh, in and took- I like care. him from Colorado. Yeah. So that, that's where I got the pass from. Um, so, ah. so, so I wrote that bill. Um, and when that government shutdown happened in 2018, 2019, I was, that was my fellowship year. So I was between offices and nobody could do anything because the government was shut down and, you know, the Congress was changing over to a new Congress. And my old um, legislative director said, Hey, Cindy, do you still have those emails and all the stuff you did on the bill? And I said, yep, of course I do. Um, and so I rewrote it and repackaged it for Jonah Goose, and it got submitted as one of his first bills, and he shepherded it all the way through the House and the Senate. I went to D.C. and watched it pass the House um, the end of February 2020, right before the world shut down. And then it passed into law that December. Um, Do you realize that you have actually passed more legislation than Jim Banks or yeah. uh, right. Mike yeah. Braun <laughs> or... Uh, Pence or Jefferson Shreve or whoever the chick is in the dude up in District Two. I mean, you you've actually Where's passed. Jordan? Yeah, you've actually passed more legislation than every almost every Republican going back who's running for office this year who's running for Congress. Yes, and and that's I mean that's why I'm running. So um, that election in 2018, um, since everyone was back in Colorado, they gave me a pass to go to the. Democrat um, watch party, which is like all of the House Democrats. And mm -hmm. um, and so there was a young man standing next to me from Oklahoma, which is where my oldest lives. And we watched Greg Pence's face splash upon the screen that he had won. And the kid turns to me and grabs a hold of me and says, you have to run. You have to run. And I was like, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, somebody's got to run. So, and Janine Lake was running. So, you know, that was, Janine ran again. And as soon as she stepped out, that's when, when I started running for this. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I appreciate it. I mean, cause here we have, uh, in the world of AI with a bunch of, um, Octarians, is that how you say it? Octarians who don't understand how to actually turn their computers on trying to discuss, you know, how do we regulate AI where we got Lori camp who was in it. And obviously most Republican men have no clue about science whatsoever, particularly biology. We have a scientist on the ballot. Y'all, I hate to, I hate to tell you this. You're overqualified. <laughs> You're overqualified. Won't be the first time. It won't be the first time. I mean, and and what does it mean? Like, and I and I I was just recognizing, like, you know, Cindy, you've passed more legislation. What does that say to you when you think about who Indiana continues to send uh, to to Washington D.C.? It's. I mean, it's frustrating because my whole time as a fellow there, I would sit in the congressional hearings and I would listen to the testimony and I would find these big gaps and holes of, of places where we need legislation to come in and and provide you know some substance there to fill in those gaps and make people's lives better and that's exactly what the job is and that's exactly what's not being done um I think Greg Penn said in an interview that um that the 
this Congress, the 118th Congress, has only enacted 42 bills. It's the yeah. smallest number since 1990. Yeah. Yeah. And it's yeah. the most unproductive Congress in history. Yeah. Um, and, and Penn says, yeah, I agree with that. We got nothing done. Yeah. Yeah. So let's nothing. send people there who can do it and want to do it and take it seriously. And that's it. What about you, Lori? So, um, yeah, my what I've heard, I haven't exactly fact checked it, but similar. It is the least productive uh, Congress in history. And my opponent is one of the least productive members of that Congress. Um, you know, in part, what is so frustrating to me is there are bills just waiting. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. we know the immigration bill. Um, there's the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, the Freedom to Vote Act. Um, I mean, a ton of good bills that could get us moving forward. I mean, and again, are are they all great bills? No. I, I mean, I've read the immigration bill. Well, let's hope they don't pass the farm bill, because if they do pass the farm bill, it will decimate Indiana small farmers. Well, OK, well, okay um, it's a time out, because literally you're segueing into the next area because I wanted oh, to kind of go through. Sorry. No, 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 no. This is great. This is great. Give us give us a, a, a few details of, of the farm bill and why it would be harmful to Hoosier farmers. Um, well, the, the two that jump out at me um, outside of what Project 2025 might do to farmers yeah. is that it increases the cost of um, farm insurance and it decreases the payout. And what? so, yeah, so basically, um, you know, in that case, the, the farmers have less protection um, in terms of and again, we have climate change going on, which a lot of our elected officials want to ignore, which is only going to make things worse. Right. Because climate isn't just the four seasons. Right. Climate is, you know, from the ocean currents to how much rain we get to temperature fluctuations. Um, I was told that the people, you know, those little maps that you see, like what you can plant or not plant you know, in your area, like zone four, zone five, they're actually changing the map this year. Mm. Um, and that is due to climate change. So, mm. um, so the big one for me on the farm bill is just that, like, again, they claim to be for farmers, but what they're doing will harm farmers. It will help big ag, right? Because all these little farmers are going to go out of business and could get snapped up by big ag. And if you look at my opponents, like the people that give him money, um, it's always the big guys, mm -hmm. um, whether it's big ag, anti-union groups, et cetera, et cetera. It's always the big guys. And so, um, you I'm know, glad you again, said that because guys, you know, every turn left, is an opportunity for you to donate to the candidates that are on the show. So I'm taking, since you said that, everybody take a moment and click the link and donate to these candidates. Uh, come on, if, even if you can just do $5 a week between now um, and the election, help these candidates out because if they're getting big money, we got to get small dollars and we got to get them in their hands quickly. But go ahead. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you there. Yeah, no. And so, um, so, you know, so that's, is alarming to me because again, if you look, farmers tend to vote R. I my, both Which we don't understand. Both have rural voters. Um, I mean, Indiana is prim primarily rural, and so it's just really frustrating to see people voting against their interests. Yeah, um, yeah. And so for me, that that's kind of the one big thing. It's like there's a whole bunch of other little teeny tiny little nicks that they'll make um, in the farm bill that. You know, they're pulling, they want to pull SNAP out, which someone's mm -hmm. like, well, it doesn't belong there anyway. But then that just makes it easier to cut SNAP benefits, which again, then hungry hurts kids, the anyone vulnerable. Yeah. Hungry kids, anyone. They, what is with them? Not, they want you to have a baby, but they don't care how you feed the baby. Yep. Does that make any sense? Yeah. Okay. I'm glad you, you brought up a lot of good stuff there because, you know, again, uh, I, I know that you have a vision and you have a plan on why you're running um, for office. However, um, a lot of, uh, you know, we know a lot of the movement is is the, the president's initiatives. Right. And, and and some of the things that they plan. So I'd like to maybe if that's all right with you, we're going to do a little, something a little different. Normally, I ask people what their three things are that they're running on. But I want to talk to you about, you know, I want to talk about. Kamala's plan. And even if you don't agree 100% with anything she's talking about, this kind of give us a good uh, way to understand how you will work in Congress when you win. 
Okay. So let's talk about, um, um, first of all, they, she's n trying to navigate. One of the things that she's talking about is lowering prescri prescription drug costs and allowing um, Medicare and Medicaid to negotiate um, drug prices. Cindy, um, it, it, how we, when you think about this particular issue, um, where does your brain go? My brain goes right to people's everyday lives. Um, when you go to a pharmacy right now, if you look um, like if, you, if you're at a pharmacy where you can see all the prescriptions that are waiting to be picked up, it is unbelievable how crowded it is, how many prescriptions there are to be picked up. So this is something that will affect almost every single person's life um, immediately. And we saw that with, you know, the, the insulin prices and the, the negotiation with a certain Medicare drugs already, you know, for senior citizens and people using insulin. But when you apply that across the board and you look at those numbers, I mean, if you've been to a drive through at any pharmacy lately, um, you're going to wait and you're mm -hmm. going to wait, you're gonna wait. Um, and and that that includes the fact that most insurance programs have gone to mail order, um, but mm -hmm. you're still. I mean, it's it's just an overwhelming, an overwhelming benefit that I think people will see, you know, right away to their to their pocketbook. And I think that's what's really important to people is how can we make um, how can we get people breathing room in any way that we can financially and economically um, because we don't have that right now. I love it, Lori. What are you, what are your thoughts? Well, believe it or not, at a meet and greet I had on Saturday, I actually sat down with a a small pharmacy owner. Um, and there are uh, pharmacy metalmen who mm -hmm. are literally the uh, part of the cause of driving up the, the prices. Um, and so the pharmacist explained to me, like, you know, when you fill a prescription, there's a certain price, then there's a like filling fee that you get back from the insurance. Of course, you know, when mm -hmm. insurance gets into it, it gets all muddied. Mm -hmm. um, so I would like to see some, again, more ability for the government to negotiate, um, definitely for Medicare, Medicaid, uh, VA benefits. Um, but I would like to see tighter regulation. I think um, we need to make sure that I, if you're aware right now, insurance companies, if they spend more than like 20% on administrative costs, they have to give you a kickback because they're only, they're supposed to spend at least 80% on your actual medical care. I'd like to see the same thing done for pharmacy mm. um, benefits and things like that. Um, Mark Cuban has done kind of a great job with his, mm -hmm. uh, his online drug selling. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and um, there's no reason that we cannot cut drugs for everyone across the board. I mean, some of these are life-saving, right? So yeah. if people are not taking them, we're literally killing them. Yeah. yeah. And the other part about that is, you know, um, and, and what I always think about is how are they charging the U.S. citizens more than they charge people in Canada or people in England? Why are, Why do we have to pay more? Hey, don't because tell there are more middlemen and we don't negotiate. Wow. That's, that's great stuff. Another thing that she talks about um, are tax credits um, for the middle class um, and obviously taxing the rich. The, the tax structure is a hot mess anyway because of all the loopholes. Um, have you thought about, you know, how you can address we 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 need to as a nation address taxes and 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 we know that the trump tax cuts increase the debt because we didn't change the spending but we need the spending because those are things that we have to take care of you know we got to take care of infrastructure got to take, but they cut the the taxes talk to me about how you think about um america's tax stru structure and how would you like to see it addressed cindy i'll start with you so i d i do like um what she's put, what um, BP Harris has put out as far as um, her her version of, of the tax program right now. I think, like you said, there are a lot of loopholes. Um, and, and I think the misinformation that's going around is, is really telling us that what she's proposing is really good because mm -hmm. they're combating that with a lot of misinformation to try to muddy that water. But in the end, it, it really does serve everyday people. Um, you know, those tax increases are only going to hit, you know, a very, very, very small percentage of people who I think it's less than 10,000 people in the whole U.S. Right, right. 
So, so I, I do think those make a lot of sense. And, and again, it's part of that, you know, giving everyday people breathing room, um, you know, and, and bringing back some of those tax credits. Um, I really like her plan for small businesses and um, those tax credits for, for startups and, and small businesses, because those are the lifeblood of our communities, especially in rural areas and suburban areas. That's where a lot of our, our, our ingenuity from, you know, in, in America comes about. And, and we've kind of been lacking in that because it's so expensive and it's cost prohibitive. Yeah. So yeah. I think those are, those are some really positive things that I'm really excited about. Okay. Okay. Lori. Um, yeah, I have to agree with Cindy. I love the small business plan. Um, you know, we need to, we need to kind of ignite the fire for small big businesses so that they do have breathing room. Um, I love that it simplifies the tax filing for them. Um, again, one of the nonprofits I volunteered for, I was the treasurer and I had to figure out how to do the taxes for a nonprofit that paid people. And it was a nightmare. I was mm. just like, oh my gosh, but we didn't have any money to hire. So I had to kind of figure it out. So um, anything that we can do to let mom and pop or, you know, your sister or brother, um, cause my sister and brother both own their own businesses, um, you know, a little bit of breathing room. I would love to see us redo our tax, uh, get rid of the loopholes. Yes. We, we need somehow to start getting rid of those. And I was raised with, you know, to those much is given, much should be returned. So um, honestly, I cannot even imagine paying a little bit more tax that on an income that you won't even notice, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the tax increases that um, Harris is talking about are people that will literally not even notice, and they will probably make an interest within a few days. Wow. I mean, we know that happens, right? Um, so, but again, I would like to cut the loopholes. I mean, is anyone not incensed about the, is it Starbucks guy who's going to get a private jet back to and from his house because they have a rule that you have to work in the office, but he doesn't want to move from where he lives. And that will be a tax deductible expense. Um, I, I start my business and, you know, I am charged for everything. So we, we've we got to, again, I'm a working person. Right? I work eight to five. I'm not sure if you guys know that, but I'm working eight to five through this whole thing. Wow. So um, I budget. I am fiscally conservative, and I know that with smart tax law and uh, smart spending, we can, you know, bring the deficit and debt down and really get our finances in order. We just need some people with common sense in the house. You know, my mama said common sense ain't so common, but you brought up the jet. Not only is it not fiscally responsible to fly on a jet, that is horrendous for the environment right now. Don't get me wrong. I was just on a plane. I went to the Dominican Republic. I can't drive there. So there. But you're not doing it like as your job every week, right? I am because not. you have to be in the office. But the, we, I mean, have, we have some election. We have environment uh, uh, deniers, climate change deniers uh, in D.C. We have people that you mentioned it early, Lori, where, you know, climate change is not four seasons. Talk to me about your stance on how we need to address climate change from a federal level. Um, well, Cindy would probably be better at this than me. She's a scientist. That's but why I started again, with you first. I mean, I, I got, you know, there's a, there's a method to my yeah. madness. <laughs> um, but so, again, I am not a throw the baby out with the bathwater person, right? We have to take small measured steps and make sure that we are, you know, addressing things things in a way that benefits the most people. Um, you know, we have all the, we, it seems like we have all these knee jerk reactions that, oh, we're going to do this. Oh no, wait, that didn't work. Oh, we're going to try this. Oh no, this doesn't work. I would just like to see us kind of go back to like when I was growing up in Indiana and things were bipartisan and you had a little push and you had a little pull, but Seriously, when I started working at the software company and traveling, people were always like, oh, Indiana, I hear that's a great place. It's beautiful, great place to raise a family. Now when I travel, they're like, Indiana, oh, I'm like, I know, I know. <laughs> and that's what, you know, the super majority has done mm -hmm. is they're just constantly, I don't know, chasing a carrot. We have to stop that. We have to use science and have scientists like Cindy and other people. Obviously, she'll be in Congress, so she won't be one of the, the scientists doing this science but you know using that kind of information to base our policies on all right cindy here you go softball 
Uh, so um, when I was a fellow, I was one of the first people to read the Green New Deal as it originally was put out because I was in the office of the chairwoman of the Science Space Technology Committee. Um, and she handed it to me and said, here, here, scientists, tell me what you think. Um, and that, I mean, it was, it was amazing because it is very aspirational and it's where we should be. But like Lori said, when the way you get there is through, through step-by-step -step things, mm -hmm. we just need to step a little quicker. Right. In India, the, the issue is, is money, which it is nationally also, because when, if we can find a way to get the money out of people being paid by these big oil companies and fossil fuel companies, then there's an incentive to change things. Um, I've been working on a project um, for a couple of years now on transitioning to hydrogen. Um, mm. And we've got big hydrogen hubs set up across the US. Europe is very far ahead of us. Um, Cummins Engine Corporation here in Columbus is making the hydrolyzers. Um, they are just opening a plant in Minnesota and there's one in Canada. And I think they're putting one in Belgium or the Netherlands. And so we have a lot of options besides fossil fuel, besides nuclear, besides um, solar and wind. You know, we have, I mean, there, there's just a collection of things that we can be using. And I, I think when we do that, then, um, and you'll be happy to know, Dana, that that does include aviation. Um, okay. <laughs> so maybe we can have those hydrogen jets that, you know, we're kind of dreaming of. Um, there's all kinds of technology there for transporting hydrogen in, in stable, stable ways. Um, but it's, it's going to be rethinking how things are done because right now we have, we have all of this infrastructure in delivering power and we can actually decentralize that to a, to a large extent, which, which is great for, um, for safety and security also. Um, so when we look at, at removing fossil fuels as the main source of our energy, we have a lot of options. Mm -hmm. Um, and, but. Of course, what's happening is the big money's coming in now. Um, yeah. And so we're going to be right back where we started because we're moving so slowly and we're so entrenched in the money buying everything that we need from these companies um, or all of the people that are in power from these companies. Yeah. Like Indiana and our state legislature, we have no ethics laws. Mm. So that's one thing that we need to change um, when we flip the supermajority and elect our state Senate and state representatives, when we can flip that supermajority, um, we can put some ethical ethics laws in place and Indiana can again be a great place to live with good air quality to breathe, good water to drink, um, and good soil that's not contaminated. Yeah, and we're not fighting over, you know, whether or not big business should get get the water or should the residents get the water, which is something asinine in my opinion. Do we do we really even need to talk about abortion? I mean, I, I, is that is, is that something we have? To, I mean, because you know they want a, a total abortion ban, national ban. Do we need to talk about it, Lori? Do we need to talk about it? I I cannot imagine any person that is of childbearing age or has a daughter of childbearing age that supports the Republican platform for an abortion ban. Um, I put out a TikTok yesterday, and I'll probably mispronounce it because I always do. Um, the the abortion drug misoprofol in on October 1st in Louisiana will be classified a dangerous substance, and so it will be taken off os ob obstetrician carts. Okay. It is a drug that stops hemorrhaging. Women will die. Um, so, you know, we're not quite there yet, but in my um, district, I have at least two counties that are medical deserts for women. The OBGYNs have no practicing privileges at a hospital, which means they have to travel out of county to get care. Um, we know that there were students uh, wanting to be OBGYNs down at IU that got moved to Illinois because they couldn't get the training that they needed. Um, those people aren't coming back. No. So, um, you know, I mean, we can, we can, I mean, we can talk about it. We can not talk about it, but um, it has to be the number one issue that we are talking about because um, again, women are going to die. Yeah. Yeah. Cindy. Absolutely. We're going to talk about it and we're going to yell about it and we're going to um, whisper quietly about it and we're going to put post-it notes in bathrooms about it. Because when 
people aren't free to make their own decisions about their own bodies, then no one's free. Right. And when people die needlessly because procedures, medical procedures that should be private anyway, that have been performed for generations are unable to be performed because of fear or illegality or whatever. Um, it's just inhumane. It is inhumane and um, it, it really, we, we've got to talk about it. We've got to keep talking about it because I think when we, when we let that sort of dissipate and we stop talking about it, um, people aren't as inclined to go vote. And mm. um, I always, I still say, Lori, like you did, because I grew up with the levers and the curtains. We all but, did. We, we are women of a certain age. <laughs> women of a certain age, yeah. <laughs> I think my great-grandmother took my mother to vote with her every time because my great-grandmother could not vote all of her adult life. And wow. so she would take my mother with her. And when I think of her, she would be voting for this because it protects all women. And I had a miscarriage. I had two. Mm. I had one that was really bad. And I think about these women today going through that, and I'm thinking how lucky I was that I was able to get care when I needed it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And today, <clears throat> women can't always get care depending on where they live. And when we stop talking about it in Indiana, the women in Washington state forget that we don't have these rights right yeah. now. Yeah. And, you know, and the reason why I asked the question wasn't that, you know, do we need to talk about it? I had a feeling that you guys were going to be right in line with, um, you know, the vast majority of American citizens, which is the crazy part to me, where over 63 percent of Americans believe that every woman should have access to the reproductive health care that they need or not need. And then to go after IVF. See, that's this is why I think Republicans have lost their rabbit ass women. How does she say it? Have they lost their minds? How do you say you pro-life, but then want to ban a tool that is pro-life? Y'all, what is it with these people, these dumbasses, sorry, these people and the wanting to get rid of IVF other than they don't want lesbian and gays to have kids? It, it's the cells because they take the ethical that it sells. I mean, I literally was at a meet the candidates and said, you know, if I have to pick between my daughter and cells, I'm going to pick my daughter every single time. And one woman said, it's not cells, it's a baby. And I was like, no, it's not yet. It could not live on its own outside. Um, I have friends who had uh, fertilized eggs that destroyed them because they were afraid what Indiana would make them do, whether they would make them actually use them or sell them or give them to someone else. Um, and they had the children that they they were hoping to have two kids and they did. So they were like, oh, we got to get rid of these. Um, but, you know, when you come back to the abortion thing, what other injury, illness, whatever could happen to you where they would make you almost be dead before they would treat you? Mm. Because that is what they are doing to women. Yes. Yes. Can you imagine saying, I've got cancer, but we're going to wait until it's eaten up all your whole body and you're on your deathbed, and then maybe we'll do something. It's insane. Absolutely. And I think um, VP Harris's question to um, one of our Supreme Court justices during his um, uh, hearing. Kavanaugh. Kavanaugh. Yeah. Um, yeah, I didn't really want to say that out loud, but... Um, <laughs> it was iconic, though. It was like, it was like the epic... Like, I'm going to show you how, how you're failing up. And that was the fall that I was in DC as a fellow. And, and it really, it really hit me when, you know, she came out and said, is there a single law that regulates men's bodies? Yeah. Not a one, not a freaking one. And you all, y'all are right. You know, women got to be dead, damn near dead, which is again, I, I'm wondering and, and, and hear me out. <laughs> I already know the answer to this. Um, is there a direct correlation between the number of women who are running for office at the top of the ticket and this, this, these clowns and their anti-abortion nonsense dudes. And I'll say, I've said it once and I'll say it a gazillion times. Half the men do not know how to navigate a woman's body, but they want to regulate it. They need to talk to a lesbian. Cause some of them don't know what they're doing. I'm just saying, I got straight friends. I know, I know, but you want to tell women, child. All right. Another topic real quick. Um, so 
the vice president has called for making college tuition free for many students. Um, but what are your thoughts on tuition free college? Uh, I don't care who goes first. I'm going to toss it to you, but can't take too much dead air time. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll go first then. Um, so for in a lot of states up until fairly recently, college was nearly free in California. It was dirt cheap. I think when I was in, in 85, I graduated from high school and I applied to the university of Arizona. And I want to say the tuition was like $4,000 a year for out of state. Wow. Um, so, but what has happened again in states that are GOP led, they keep cutting funding, right? I mean, that's why in Wisconsin, when the GOP was in control, they started closing satellite campuses of the University of Wisconsin. Um, in Indiana, we've never been super generous with it, but again, for many, college is now the equivalent of high school almost mm -hmm. um, or trade school. I talked to our union here and in the um, IBW, for example, they have an apprenticeship and when they're done, they have an associate's degree. And like with one more year of classes, they have a degree like in electrical stuff. So um, I like that electrical need... stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's I'm not an electrical person, um, but again, they want you know, they were upset about our, the Indiana diploma thing, which is a whole nother story for another day, because they're like, we need smart kids. The trades need smart kids. Everyone always asks like trades. Oh, if you know, but no, every, really everything takes a level of, mm -hmm. of knowledge. It might not be the same. Like, obviously I don't know about science like Cindy does, but she might not know about the contract stuff. Like I do. Right. I mean, right. we each get a little specialized and we need secondary education, whether it's college, trade school, whatever, um, to do that. And we do need to make it lower cost. It's almost like companies have kind of tried to push um, training costs to high schools and colleges on things that you used to get trained like on mm -hmm, the job. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Go so um, I agree. We need to figure out a way to make college much more affordable for everyone, whether it's community colleges free for two years, you know, the equivalent of high school, or we just lower tuition so that it doesn't take you six years to pay for one semester of school where it used to take you a summer job. Um, but something has to be done because yeah. we need smart kids. We yeah. need smart people. Yeah. Yeah. Cindy. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, I think college costs have, have gotten out of hand. Um, I mean, like you said, it used to be able to, you could work a job in the summer or even work while you went to school and, and pay it and you didn't come out with all these loans. Um, I mean, I, and and when we look at even the loan structure, you know, the what's been given to the companies that are, you know, servicing those and yeah. it, it's really in disservice to all of our students and, and all of our population because we need an educated population, and that doesn't mean a college degree for everyone, but it means those who want one are able to attain one without sacrificing the entire rest of their lives. Right, right. And, you, and go ahead. we have a medical professionals right now because who can afford to go to medical school? You know, and so now you're we have we have doctors' offices that have like two and three month waits because we don't have enough people to staff those um, nursing people can't afford to go to nursing school. And I, and I think we're going to, we're going to find that, that we're going to start to have to put um, priority on things that will make people's lives better. And that's one of those things. And a university as a profit center is, is not, is not really what the university is supposed to be. No, no. And here's the thing, you know, I thought, that's what we were sending people to DC to do was to represent the people. That's why they base um, the, how many districts you have based on the population and your counties, the, the counties that you get and the number of people in your, are, are based on a number of people, not a number of businesses. And, and and until we decide that we want to take this government back, and I don't mean from Republicans or Democrats, I'm talking about the fact that we are not holding people accountable the way we should. Because I tell you what, Joe Manchin, mm, I ain't finna talk about him, and he a Democrat. So it's uh, anybody can get this smoke. Anybody can get this smoke. Okay, one last topic, and I'm gonna end on this, uh, guys. When you're in Congress. 
um, you guys will be voting on the budget and your budget will have line items in it that are, um, are we giving uh, assistance to Ukraine? Are we giving assistance to Israel? There are going to be um, times where, you know, oh, we're going to ignore the Congo. Uh, are we going to help Taiwan? There's a lot of foreign um, issues that come with this role. Okay. Um, talk to me about your, um, how you view your responsibilities in dealing with our foreign affairs. And I'll start with you, Cindy, since you be all over the world doing sciencey things. <laughs> so one of the things I did learn when I was in DC is how, um, how fragile a lot of those relationships are and how there's a lot of things going on that the general public knows nothing about. Um, so when I look at, you know, people ask me questions of, you know, what should we do in, with Ukraine? What should we do with Israel? What should we do with Palestine? What should we do with the Congo? Um, things like that. Um, as a person running for office, I don't have access to a lot of the information that mm -hmm. I need to really make good decisions about that. But we also have a whole branch of government devoted to that foreign policy and diplomacy. And that's one of the things that's on the chopping block for Project 2025. Um, which we didn't even it, touch tonight. Which we didn't even go into. And and I think that's one of those, those things where it's not that I don't want to give you an answer because, I mean, I always want to put people first. I want to put democracy first. I, um, you know, those kinds of things are, are vitally important. Sure. But then again, I may not know everything behind all of those decisions that are being made right now. And for me sitting here in Columbus, Indiana, to make a decision about that and put it out there is here's what I would do is I think for me, pretty irresponsible um, knowing what I know and things that go into those decisions. So it's not that I want to give a non-answer, but you know, me personally, um, I think we need to retain our, our human lens on everything and remember that everyone across the world is a human being. And yeah. when we keep that top in our minds, I think that can drive a lot of, a lot of decisions, but maybe not all of them. I yeah. mean, there's just other factors that, that I may have no idea about. Um, love it. Love that answer. Actually, Lori, what you got? Yeah. Um, well, I agree with, Cindy, actually, when, I'm, when people ask me about it at Meet the Candidates, I often say, well, I can't even tell you what I don't know, right? Mm -hmm. Because once you get into gov government, you're given certain um, clearance and stuff, and you get to find out more things. So you can say, oh, I'm this, and then you get to government, and you find out, oh. And so much like Cindy, I don't want to spout off. Um, I mean, you know, as a mom, as a kind human, um, my heart breaks for everyone across the world, right? We are all people. We all want good things for our kids. We all want, um, you know, happy lives. And um, I would hope that kind of, you know, we, the U.S. has always been kind of that beacon on the hill. We, we've not always lived up to that ideal, but okay. I, like, I like to think that we usually try. Um, now, you know, again, throwing Project 2025 out of the picture, Bad but I think most of the public servants actually want to not only make America a great place, but have the world be a great place. Um, and so, you know, my kind of overarching thing is when I look at stuff is, you know, like, who are we hurting? Who are we helping? You know, what is being uh, put forth? You know, and, um, you know, it's kind of with if you want to take the Ukraine as an example, right? Who's benefiting if we help the Ukraine? Who benefits if we don't help the Ukraine? Mm. Um, mm. And Interesting question. You know, so you and, and I'm guessing that people that have the clearance know these things. Right. Um, and so to me, it's it's hard. I look at it. First of all, again, I want the world to be a better, kinder place. So I always want to look at it from a human rights kind of aspect too, to make sure that we're not harming um, those that we should be helping. But um, it's really hard for me to say exactly what policy I would write without knowing a lot of the underlying, um, you know, like, I mean, again, look at what um what happened during the dnc where they were negotiating for the release of hostages yeah right we did nothing about that yeah yeah so so you know again it's it's hard when you don't know what you don't even know to 
formulate a really good answer that's going to make anybody happy. You know, I actually um, like the way y'all uh, um, framed it because everybody's got an opinion. You know, um, I, 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 I hurt, and this is this is something that I read where someone was outlining um, how how disproportionately the information even gets to us, right? Um, where as a nation we weeped for the hostages, the six hostages, um, the Israeli hostages that they found was it six? I think it was six, right? They found the six that were um, apparently murdered, and it was. Um, uh, national news as it should have been, but nobody is talking about the 40,000 Palestinians. So it's like, even the way that we get the information is almost like, okay, wait a second, because none of that is good. None of that no. is good. And I, I purposefully, um, stay as far the hell away from, uh, Middle East conversations because the bottom line is it's they want what's under the Middle East and that's back to uh, the crude that pumps out and who and sometimes I, I believe sometimes chaos allows you to get those resources so as long as it's chaotic mm -hmm. um, then then those resources come to the billionaires and they can do the thing all right and guys you know what obviously we could talk all night because this has been fantastic um, thank you for stepping up and running for Congress for the first time, Lori, and for the second time, actually, is this the third time? Third time, Cindy? Um, you guys are th are thinkers, and you guys process things. And we have a bunch of knuckleheads out here who are mostly interested in how is it going to benefit me when I win this election? And you're thinking about it, how are my constituents and the, the citizens of, of Indiana and the Americans as a whole will benefit from me being in office. And I want to thank you for that, for, for that humanity. Um, but we've been wrapping for almost a, an hour and a half. <laughs> Cindy, tell the people where they can find you. So we are at www.wirth, the number four, congress.com. And do you have any events coming up? Oh, my goodness. Um, Fundraisers? <laughs> We have a, we have a lot. Um, tomorrow night we have a pre pride party right out in front of my house in Columbus. Nice. Six to I, 11 PM. Oh, so it's Columbus pride this weekend. Columbus pride is this weekend on Saturday. We'll be there. We have a seven, six district picnic also on Saturday. So I'll be at both of those. Um, the 13th, we have a big fundraiser in Perry 14th. We have three things in Hancock beach wow. Grove and Bartersville. I mean, it just, so goes we can on. visit your website and get all that good stuff. Um, reach out to us. Um, okay. We've found that it's a little problematic to publish things sometimes. Really, you having some? Out. You having some uh, issues? Uh, well, we're 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 we got them. I think we got them. So, but reach out to us because we are all over all eleven counties every week. <laughs> uh, we just... never stop. I don't like bullies and I hate punks. So if you ever need me to come through, I will come through. We had a, we had an issue. We had an issue. Uh, 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 some clown, you know, harassing act blue people, and I was so upset that I wasn't there. Probably was a good thing that I wasn't there because I probably would have got fired because I wouldn't have stood for it. But I don't like bullies and I don't like punks. And, I, and those are the people, you were a whole woman and was probably some dude. And it was some dude who feels like it's okay to go and intimidate a woman. You punk, you, you little human you. And I said it. So come for me. It's on our Facebook page. Um, so, and we'll be, we'll be pushing those out, but. Um, come for me. Okay. We got you, Cindy. Lori, tell the people where they can find you. Um, I'm at www.campforecongress.com, um, and we do have pretty much everything on our website. I am one of the uh, things I didn't get to share is I did get a uh, former uh, congressperson, former senator, former ambassador Joe Donnelly's uh, endorsement, and Yay. he is holding a fundraiser for me on the 16th here in South Bend. Excellent. Um, we are trying to raise money. We have commercials um, that are running on TV and we are trying to make sure that we can run those all the way right up to the election. A um, couple of house parties this weekend. Um, Saturday, I'm a keynote speaker at two events, one in Rochester and one in Peru. Um, what else? Uh, I'm out 
kind of west in New Carlisle on the 24th. Um, we'll be at an open house at St. Joe County. But again, we're putting everything on the website. We haven't run into any trouble yet, um, but I do always have a person with me. I never travel alone. We don't do anything alone. But Excellent. Um, Excellent. So yeah, having, uh, again, if, uh, former Ambassador Donnelly's uh, uh, endorsement was uh pretty exciting because um, I always kind of looked up to him. He was, um, he's a little bit more probably socially conservative than I am, but we're both kind of fiscally conservative. But, um, you know, again, having a person that kind of represented real people as opposed to special interest. Um, I mean, he's, he was the last Congress person in my district that did that. So um, it was kind of a big deal for me. But um, again, thank you so much, Dana, for having me on here because um, I love talking. And Cindy, it was great getting oh, to talk to you. This was great. I'm telling you, we were just like homies kicking it. Guys, yes, thank, you, thank you so much for tuning, joining me tonight. Thank you for sharing your stories and your insight and your intellect. Thank you for being amazing women who are saying, I am not, I am not going back. All right, don't hang up yet. Don't hang up yet. Uh, guys, listen. Uh, woo! That was a great show. I'm full. Um, I love it when I get a chance to talk to candidates who actually kind of get it. Like, most of the candidates I talk to get it. But this was great. These women are, are intelligent in their own space, and they don't have to put up with harassment. I'm really upset about that. That bothers me. Man, don't... Anyway, let, let it go, Dana. But I... Last thing I want to say is, um, if you are not busy on September the 8th um, at Life Journeys, Life's, Journeys, Life's Journey Church here in Indianapolis, we are having a voter registration drive. This is a nonpartisan because it's the church. And I'm going to be broadcasting live from the church because I want you guys to get registered to vote. You got one more month to get registered to vote um, so that you can cast your ballot because you cannot sit this one out. This is not the one to sit out. It's not the one, the lesser two damn evils. No, one person wants to destroy democracy. The other one wants to give you, you know, better health care. One person wants you, you know, to subjugate black people. And the other one is black. <laughs> One person wants to tell women, you don't know what you're doing with your, your own body. The other one is a woman. The other one is a felon. The other one's a prosecutor. This, the, 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 it couldn't be more stark right there. So if you're not doing anything, join us, uh, Life's Journeys Church, and you can Google it where it is. I don't have the address in front of me, but we are having a voter registration drive. And come meet some more, you know, if, if whether you gay, straight, whatever, if you're an ally, if you're a candidate, you want to meet some gay constituents, come to Life's Journey. That's what we had on Sundays. Yes, we we believe. We believe. Y'all didn't think we did. But um, and next week, next week, next week, we have a very, very special show. I will be having on next week, September 12th, and I will be advertising for this early our candidate for governor, our candidate for governor, Jennifer McCormick. Yes. Uh, hopefully, Terry will be there as well. Um, but for sure, for sure, we'll have the candidate. And this will be great. It'll be before their debates. And you guys can get a good feel. You see how we do these conversations. They're fun, light, and lively. And you can see her personality. So to make sure you tune in next week because we will be talking to candidate for Go Indiana governor, Jennifer McCormick. Y'all, I will holler at y'all next time. Peace. Turn Left is the property of Black Pearl IT Solutions. Executive producer, Indiana's own Dana Black. Music by www.binsound.com.